Hello, everyone. <laughs> Welcome. Thank you for joining us. My name is Felipe Lemaitre. I'm the director of developer relations here in AWS. And I'm here with a cloud legend, Jeff Barr. Jeff, thank you for joining us. Really happy to be here. Appreciate all the work you did to get this set up. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, Jeff is a vice president here in AWS. I think everyone knows Jeff. That's why you are here. But um, I, I have to say, he, he is our chief evangelist. And I think he has been the first cloud evangelist. Um, so it's, it's amazing to, to talk to you, Jeff, and, and hear some of the stories on, on AWS and, and the cloud in general. Before we get started, I would like to get to know the audience for, for a moment. So who here is on the technical side? Developer, IT professional, architect, so raise your hand. Most of you are. So keep it, keep it up if you have been doing this for five years. 10 years. OK, half there. 15 years. OK, Yo younger audience then. <laughs> 20 years. OK, great. Thank you. I think we need a 25. Oh, someone 25. <laughs> That's awesome. Thank you. So Jeff, I'm thinking let's, let's travel back in time to what I think is the beginning, and then we can reconstruct year by year this, um, this past few years of cloud history, if, if that makes sense. So I want to start in, in a moment where I think it's where everything started for you. And you'll have to correct me. But this is Jeff, 16 years old, working on a computer shop, moving boxes and unpacking boxes. Mm -hmm. But that was, that was your official job, but that was not what you were doing. Exactly. So I, I was really lucky when I was 16 years old. I was at, I, there was this computer club in Seattle called the, the Northwest Computer Club. And I was by far the youngest person there. And this was in the days of the very first personal computers, long before the IBM PC. So this was the days of like the, the Altair and the MSI, and I think maybe the Apple One and so forth. So I was at this computer club, and I met this, um, this guy, Steve, who we got, became really quick friends. And he just mentioned one night, he said, well, we're, I'm, I got hired as the manager of this computer store in Seattle. And I know you really need some hands-on time with computers. So let's give you the job of store janitor. But really, it's just so you can come in and play with the computers. And my official job was really to receive all the books and magazines and literature that showed up and to just slice open the boxes, put them all on the shelves. But I would spend a lot of my time actually reading all that content, absorbing it. I'd often borrow it for the night, read it on the bus, bring it back the next morning. Nobody, nobody was the wiser. And I quickly got to know the, the tech. And I was, in Amazon terms, it was, it was diving deep. And I would, I would understand all this tech. And then customers would come into the store and say, can I use this memory board with this computer? Or how do I do this? And They'd ask all the other employees who were just kind of working there, not super into it. But I actually had put the time in to really understand the industry. And mostly at this point, there was a lot of hardware, just a bit of software. And despite being a lot younger, I was the one who got to explain all this to customers. And weirdly enough, I still think I have that same job of just diving deep into something interesting and explaining it. Yeah, that's amazing. Clearly, you are, you are and you have always been a, a great explainer. So you started eventually building software. I think you, you were part of a, a couple of projects around RSS, XML. I think eventually one, one was called Syndicate before Headline Viewer. What, what was that all about, and why was it interesting for you? So I've always been someone who liked to absorb news. And back when I, I spent some time at Microsoft, and XML was just getting started. And I thought XML was kind of a, a cool thing. Wanted to learn a bit about that. And I was also on the Visual Basic team at Microsoft. And Visual Basic was actually a really nice development environment. I, I saw this emergence of something called RSS that was this really neat XML representation of headlines. And I started to see just a few sites publishing RSS feeds to share their content. This must be 20 plus years ago at this point. So I saw a few sites starting to publish their content as RSS. I built this little Visual Basic app called Headline Viewer and, and gave it away for free. But I also spent a lot of time just cold calling literally websites and saying, 
there's this neat thing called RSS, and you have this kind of headline structure to your site. Maybe you should actually start publishing RSS. I had a bunch of great success with that. But I was also building up this collection of sites. And then people started saying, well, your app is OK, but your, your collection of sites is a lot more interesting. And so I set up this site called Syndicate, and I, I wrote a ton of PHP. Like, I probably ended up writing 80,000 lines of PHP in my, my spare time to put this site together. We have tens of thousands of sites in there. Ultimately, it was a great thing to do because I had a very simple web service interface on it, which ended up helping me to get my job at Amazon. It also kind of flamed out because I couldn't scale. I had this one server I was paying for. I had no idea how to make it run on more than one server. And this was way before EC2. This was way before load balancing. This was, I didn't even know what a load balancer was way back then. And as you were, as you were discovering and playing with web services, you, you discover this web service from, from Amazon. And by the way, given the composition of the audience, that over there is a CD in a custom <laughs> form, which used to be cool. So, you know, <laughs> go figure. Um, so eventually you got access to that SDK and, and perhaps to one of the first truly useful web services. How, how was that? So I had been working at Microsoft, and if you know your web services history, and some of you that kept your hands raised for a long time, if you remember things like SOAP and WSDL and UDDI, all those really early, really hard to use web services, I had spent time working with those a little bit at Microsoft, and then I, I left Microsoft, I was consulting really in that same space. But it was really hard to explain the value and the benefit of web services. We, we could explain it to each other as technologists. We could say, computer here, computer here, internet in the middle, and we're connecting across port 80, and amazing things happen. As technologists, we'd look and say, wow, that's awesome that we can make these connections happen. You'd show it to a business person, they're like, big deal. The computers are talking to each other. It was really hard to explain. And then I saw the announcement of this, this very first Amazon web service. And it just caught my eye right away because it was, it was something more interesting than a stock quote or the weather or a currency conversion. It was actual access to the Amazon product catalog. And I, I saw that. I signed up. I downloaded it right away. I think I wrote a little toolkit in PHP to access it. I sent some email back to Amazon telling them how cool I thought this all was. And before I knew it, they said, hmm, we love your feedback. Come and tell us some more. And before I knew it, I was at this little tiny dev conference that Amazon put together in their, their Pac-Med building, our old, old headquarters. And I, I have this memory of this moment of somebody getting up and saying, well, we put this first web service online. We sent out these CDs. It worked so incredibly well that we're thinking of taking the rest of the company and somehow putting more web services there. And I thought, wow. So I was, I'd been at Microsoft. I grasped the value of having effectively a developer community and some kind of a set of APIs for developers. And I suddenly thought, wow, this, this is like, kind of feels like the future to me. I've got to be a part of this. And I, you don't actually get to see the future very often, but that was that light bulb time for me of like, wow, this is where the world's going. I need to actually do something to help, out, help this to succeed. Wow, that's amazing. <laughs> so 2002. Now, uh, one, one, yes. one note, though, on, on, the, on that CD, it, it says, work hard, have fun, and make history. The first, th those are all really fun, great things to do. The, the part I found that we're actually very bad at in the industry is capturing the history. Some of these things are really not all that old. We're not great at an industry of recording the fact that all these things happened, that we did them, and how and why and what we did, and somehow memorializing them in a, in a, a really helpful and thoughtful way. I, I think you never know you're making history until it's actually too late. You, it's easy to look back and say, OK, we launched SQS or we launched S3, and we knew for sure it was going to be this amazing success and lead to all this stuff. You actually don't. You really, really don't. There's never a beginning that says, you never get the event that says, about to change the world. Please care collect all the history. You only know that in retrospect when you've already done something amazing. You say, I sure regret not capturing the history a lot better. That's a great point. <laughs> well, maybe that's a book on the making. Well, except not all that history has been captured. And that's, that's, that's actually the, the, the weird challenge, is you don't quite know what's important at the start until after you've been through it. And then you have to kind of go through this somewhat kind of 
foggy lens of, well, what, why did we make these decisions? And AWS isn't that old, but there's, there's bits of it that are effectively their history already of how do we decide to build S3 or how do we decide to set pricing models. And surely there, there's some great stories floating around, but the, the details get lost pretty quickly. Yeah, no, absolutely. So you joined Amazon 2002. Again, given the mm -hmm. audience composition, 2002 have no iTunes. <laughs> uh, iPods were barely a thing, obviously no iPhone. So a lot of, a lot of digital transformation has, has happened since. What, I mean, obviously no cloud, servers in a closet, co-location, those were the things that we had to live with. What, what was your thinking when you joined Amazon? Was this the light bulb moment and just ride the wave? Like, what were you thinking? So let's see, I, I showed up and I, I knew that, I'm not sure they or we, at this point, they, before I showed up, they had this first initial web service and I really didn't know quite how deep it truly went inside the company. And I ended up with, my, my first job was actually a development manager on the Amazon Associates team. So the Amazon Associates team it was and still is our affiliate program. And it turned out that the, all these initial web services that we built had been effectively set up to make it easier for us to build versions of the site for various kinds of mobile devices. So now we've got these really powerful phones that do anything we want, but back then, every phone used a slightly different, really bad, not very easy to use subset of HTML. So part of the technology that powered these initial web services was this XSLT transformation engine that would take the raw output from the web service and just map it into any XML or HTML. Who remembers XSLT here? Oh, what I would have thought. Who, who would hands? still want to use it again if you had to? Uh, I knew it. Okay. Zero hands. Yes. Um, so I, I have to say that once I arrived, it was clear that the web services were in a much more nascent state than I would have thought. So I, I was doing my, my main work on the associates team. But my manager, his name was Larry, he said, Jeff, I know that your, your heart really lies with the web services. So spend some fraction of your time helping this team out. It was undefined as to what I would do or how much time I had, but I just looked for things to be done. And we, we had a set of forums, and so I love to just get on the forums and help customers with questions. We needed some more functionality, some search functionality on the service, so I just said, okay, I'll, I'll just write some Perl. And, and uh, I think that was my third and final time I had to learn Perl. So I, I did some Perl to, to help with some new search functions. And at a certain point, maybe four months in, the, the rest of the team kind of came to me in this somewhat ominous way. And they said, Jeff, you're the new guy, and we're dumping this thing on you. I'm like, oh, great. What is this? And they said, well, we've got this conference, and someone's got to speak at it, and we're not going to do it, so it's your problem. I'm like, oh, awesome. I love conferences. I'd be happy to do that. So I, I took that one, and they gave me a, a couple more, and they started signing up for more conferences. And not too long after that, an another manager came to me and she said, Jeff, we've got this job here. It's called Web Services Evangelist. We have been trying so hard to fill this position and we have not found anybody actually qualified for it. But now that we're seeing who you are and what you're up to, we actually think you're the right person for this job. Do you want this new job? And I, I took a look and I, my family was really young at that point, so I checked in to make sure they'd be okay with some travel. I said, sure, I'd love to do this instead. And there was no actual deep mission statement. To me, it was basically take these services and get them in front of developers. You know, we, now we write these really complicated, really verbose, well thought out docs. To me, it was just take the services, get them in front of developers. That was the extent of my planning process. That's awesome. So let's jump to 2003. I think a historic moment, and you were part of this. And I'm speaking specifically about this meeting that happened in Jeff Bezos' house with Andy Jassy. You were there, a lot of heavy hitters. I mean, it's part of the folklore, I think, of the cloud at this point, and there are a few articles, but you were actually there. So what, what, was, the, what was the objective of the meeting? What happened there? What do you still remember from, uh, from that moment? This like, is where I sure wish I'd taken really good notes yeah. and captured and say, here we are at the dawn of the cloud era. 
that would have been so awesome to capture. And I, I for sure remember being there. There was a whole protocol for being, being like the address of his house being disclosed, and they make sure that you were a safe person to let within proximity of Jeff, and you'd show up. And I think we went down to the the boathouse, and it was it was a brainstorming session, effectively of what customer problems could we solve? And it, it wasn't about what technologies do we have and how could we put them to use. It was what problems could we solve for our customers? And we just ended up with a lot of lists. I remember just a lot of lists emerging out of that. And we, we took those lists and fleshed them out. But it was, it, it's, if, if I'd known how, how pivotal that was, I sure would have taken a lot of notes and some good pictures and memorialized it, but it was, like, wow, let's just all go off-site for a bit and, and brainstorm some great ideas. Now, solving these customer problems coming from a set of core competencies around the store and logistics and certain things, so this, this was kind of a big jump, right, to start to, to start to brainstorm about new services, CC2, S3, all of those things are big jumps. What, were there many other big jumps that were abandoned, or was this a very natural one? I think we quickly categorized into things like storage and compute and messaging, database. I think we, we, we threw out lots and lots of different ideas, pay payments, networking. We, it, it seemed to actually coalesce into a, a pretty clear set of things that we, we thought would be useful, which we would then go out and we talked to a lot of internal and external customers and say, if we had any of these, would these be of use and value to you? And they're like, yeah, of course, those would be actually awesome to have. Mm. Now, now, for me, part of this was actually going back to my experience with Syndicate and having it be when, when I wanted a second server, I had to basically, I was using a colo company and I had to like pay for an, an entire server for a year. And that, that, the, the, the granularity of getting a server was a year. And for us to be able to say, well, we're taking that down to what was at first an hour and now it's a, a second was, Truly amazing. And I, I think this is one of those interesting things where you have to somewhat live the history to fully appreciate the value. I, I think we can now take for granted, oh, oh wow, big deal. I can, get, I can run a Lambda function. I can pay 0.00000 something for the execution of that function. The world wasn't always that way. But having lived through the old way of getting a server and loading the OS onto it and being responsible for OS upgrades and patching and security and all those things yourself, the, the, something about that experience actually helps you to better value how awesome things are today. Yeah, no, I agree. I remember reading in this time that there was this mandate from, from Jeff into the company of making sure that all services use APIs to connect to each other and that the APIs were easily ported externally or open externally. Was, is this connected? Was this before, after, a consequence? Okay, so... When you used to join Amazon as a developer, you get, they give you a developer desktop, and they'd buy pretty much the, the most high-powered x86 machine you could get with as much memory as possible. And then they'd hand you off a set of directions and say, here's how you, here's how you build a retail site. Don't come back until you've actually successfully built the retail site. And the, if, you, if you remember early Amazon, if you remember the URLs, there used to be this thing called OBIDOS, O-B-I-D-O-S in the URLs. Anybody remember Obidos? Oh, okay, one. Okay, Two three. Hands, okay, three great. Hands. Okay, so Obidos was the monolithic app that was Amazon.com, and it was this huge hairball of C and C++ that would take many hours to compile and even more time to to link. And the the iteration time that you could do was limited by how quickly could you recompile and relink this thing and for some reason, you'd always have to find every spare bit of memory on your dev machine and just delete every extra service and process so you could get every bit of memory to link. And it was, ultimately, that was the limit of, we, we couldn't develop very fast because we had this one gigantic binary that would take forever and you would you'd dread cha changing a header file because you'd know that that was gonna be 24 hours worth of, of compile and link. So. At some point, they said, this is actually in the way of progress. We just need to smash this monolith into a bunch of pieces. And th there, I don't remember that, that memo. That there, there is a memo that's in wide circulation that says, we've got to take, take this big monolith and break it up into pieces and use well-defined APIs. 
I, I think I had already moved over enough into evangelism by then that I wasn't deep in the, the engineering culture at that point. Okay, got it. So let's quickly change topics to one of your other passions. <laughs> I think a lot of people know these. You, you love Legos. You have a huge collection of Legos. Um, perhaps other fans in the room. So raise your hand if you uh, were at some point a Lego <laughs> fan. And awesome. keep it up if you still like <laughs> Legos. Okay, so maybe one third of the audience. Um, but you did something that leveraging Amazonian words was very peculiar. You actually put together these scenes in Lego sculptures <laughs> to describe the leadership principles back then, 14. Was that part of your learning process? <laughs> were you just trying to show how Amazonian okay. you were? Like, what was the... I had a lot of fun doing that. And the way it came about is that as an evangelist, preferably when you go to your customer, you talk to the customer in their native language, right? So you, you want, if, if you go outside the US, it, 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 a lot of people can understand English, but you're, you're doing them a great courtesy if you can speak to them in their own language. So I had been invited to go to Lego headquarters in Denmark to talk to them about leadership principles. And I think I'd been just kind of playing around with a couple of bricks and I might have built a little door desk or two. And I got this invitation to go to Denmark and suddenly I thought, well, I'm going to talk to them about our culture of innovation and leadership principles. What better language to express the leadership principles than their own product? And so I, I put a lot of work into building the, what were then the 14 leadership principles and turning the concepts into bricks was, was really fun and just kind of drove a lot of creativity on my part and b built these neat things. I got a lot of good feedback from my wife as I would build something and I'd say, which leadership principle is this? And she's like, oh, that doesn't match any of them. That, you need to really fix this up a bunch. And uh, got, got some great feedback and got them all built and took some good pictures of them. And I, I took them with me. I, I took the pictures to, to Denmark and it went over incredibly well. I, I was in the, where was I? I was in like the, the, the cafeteria of Lego headquarters in Billund. It was kind of surreal to end up in a place like that. And presented them and they, they totally got it. And then afterward they said it was kind of a neat thing that they'd, I'd use their product in that unique way to communicate. So very, very much worth, well worth doing. Wow, that's fun. <laughs> so let me jump to 2005. <laughs> this is the year where YouTube and Reddit were founded. And this is a picture of the Professional Developer Conference oh my. from Microsoft oh in 2005. <laughs> and this is actually a fun coincidence. Like sometimes the industry is so small. We were both in that same conference. Really? I was a technical evangelist for Microsoft. <laughs> and you were there with this booth in the, you know, with, with all the partners presenting their solutions. And I actually <laughs> remember going to this booth um, for the purpose of this conversation, I will say that you g gave me the presentation. Okay. Because honestly, I don't remember. Well, but it so, was great. So on the left is, is Rudy Valdez, who was the original biz dev person for S3. Maybe, maybe it was Rudy. <laughs> and, but what, what I remember about this is I was obviously obsessed with .NET versus Java. That was the thing of the entire re developer relations organization, which was huge. And, and you were talking about cloud, and I have to confess, it went over my head. Like, I, I did not understood it well. I said, oh, cool, cool stuff, keep playing. And I just went <laughs> along. And I wonder, was that a common reaction in 2005, or was, just, uh, was I just very obtuse back then? Or? Well, I, I think that it takes a long time to figure out how to explain something properly. And what, I think one of the fun parts of the jobs that you and I have is, we have one concept and we can keep experimenting with different ways to communicate the concept until after you've said almost the same words a hundred times, you finally hit that one way to say it where it feels right to you and, it, and your audience is like, yeah, now we actually understand what you've been talking about for so long. So it, now we, we call that, if we're in marketing, we, that's the, the messaging, but just figuring out the right way to communicate that is, can, can take quite some time. So, so Rudy and I actually shared an office for quite some time. And in the early days of S3, Rudy spent his entire day on the phone cold calling companies and saying, hi, this is Rudy from Amazon. And do you need any internet storage? He must have said that a hundred times a day. And he was calling companies 
I don't know where he, he sourced his leads, but he was just calling companies to see if he could sell them some S3. And at that point, no one knew that Amazon had any kind of a, a web services business, and he had to explain S3 totally from scratch, but he, he managed to build that initial set of customers right there in his, on his door desk in the PacMed building. Wow. That's fun. So let's jump to um, 2006. <laughs> this is when um, Google buys YouTube. I think no iPhones yet at this point. And we have here your, your sculpture of one <laughs> of the principles, Think Big. And this, this certainly applies to AWS, but I wonder what was the expectation of, of growth and of impact on AWS back in this moment? Well, I look at this blog post and I'm thinking, if I'd known what was going to happen with S3, I probably would have put a little bit more time into it. I mean, there's, there's no pictures. I, I, I literally was actually um, getting ready for a, a, a plane to Silicon Valley as I put that together. Now our launch process is actually a lot more organized. Clearly we knew that storage could be a good business. I, I'm sure that we did some level of research that said, yes, people could actually make good use of this. I think a lot of us within the group had somehow tried to do something ourselves and realized it's actually a, a pretty difficult problem. And we, we went off and we, we built S3. We, we kept it super easy to, to understand and to explain and, and to use. And we, we put it out there. And the world looked and said, wow, this, this is a thing I didn't know for sure I needed, but it's exactly what I was looking for. And it, it just took off really, really quickly. Now, I don't remember paying too much attention to metrics. I, I've generally focused more on just doing my part of the job versus looking at how many of this and how many of those. And I, I certainly remember when I start hearing about billions of tens of billions, and now we're at 100 trillion plus objects, which is just one of these just hard to actually map to reality kinds of numbers. But I, I, again, I, I do look at that, it's like, hmm, I, I should have put at least some code in there or a picture or something. <laughs> Can I go back and fix that one? <laughs> sure. So here, here are a few additional screenshots from, from those blog posts. And I think this was a moment of a lot of launches, a lot of features, explosive growth. But the part that it's more interesting for me is consistency. Like, you could actually take something that was built back then, and most of the things are still running the same way. So what, what are your thoughts around consistency of the services? We have an awesome engineering community at Amazon. And there, there's a really strong community of these folks with the title of principal engineer that are ultimately responsible for making sure that we're, we're building services that are secure, that are scalable. They, they have a good understanding of the past, so they're able to really look at, at designs, especially API designs and API structure do their best to get consistency in there. Now, are we perfectly consistent across all the APIs? We're, we're not, and we, we always wanted to get better, but there's a, there is a very strong engineering community there that, that's trying to, to make things as, as robust as possible. The, the, the clarity of messaging is something we focused on from the very, very beginning. I mean, there, there were certainly, we can go back before EC2. There was, if, if you remember Sun Microsystems, Sun Microsystems had the Sun Cloud, and it was, I don't think they explained it really well. I think their business model wasn't very, very clear. I think you had to send them jar files or something in order to actually run code on the, the Sun Cloud. And we, we, we looked at so many different aspects of this. And there, there's so many pieces we had to get right. We had to, what is the service? How do you program it? How do you describe it? What is it named? How do you actually bill for it? There's so many little pieces that all have to be Actually, I won't say perfect because you can always do better, but they have to be really, really good before you, it's going to resonate with the audience. And one of the things that I wish I could measure, because I just have this intuitive sense, is that the fact that so many early devs bought their programming books from Amazon. They bought their, their Netscape Navigator book, and they bought their Perl programming book, and their Introduction to HTML book. They bought all of those things from Amazon. They were early adopters of, of e-commerce because they were already online. I, I have this just sense that, that those early customers of tech books 
were kind of primed to actually use web services from Amazon because they, they knew us as a brand, they were comfortable buying things online, and when we said, okay, we're going from selling you physical books to selling you some services, there was a, a fairly small leap there that actually they were, they were willing to cross. Or jump, I guess. Yeah, no, you're, you're right. So I'll jump to 2007. And we actually found... Oh, no. <laughs> right, uh, take, oh, let me just start. This is, this is a rare footage of uh, Jeff presenting AWS services in five minutes in, in an event, in a community event called Ignite Seattle, I, I think. Yeah, that sounds right. So I'll, I'll play a minute. We don't need to see the five minutes, but then you can, you can tell us more about this, this period. All right, uh, take a really deep breath and you're not allowed to blink for the next five minutes. I'm Jeff Barr, Amazon Web Services Evangelist, going to talk to you about how we've put 10 different web services on top of our infrastructure and how over our 200,000 developers have built really cool applications on top of what we've done. Okay, our web services are APIs plus business models built, broken down into four categories. Oh my gosh. So that, was, that was fun. Um, what, what, what was this time? Tell us a little bit more about the event and the period. Well, let's see. So I love the concept of Ignite, and the concept still exists to this day. And the, model, the presentation model is called Pecha Kucha. And you get five minutes and 20 slides, and the slides auto advance. And you have to cram as much useful information as possible into those five minutes. And I, I probably put too much on my slides, as I'm prone to do. And uh, it sure looked like I was running at very, very high speed there to, to do that. <laughs> was, was there anything that you expect that people would just gravitate quickly or, or conversely? Were you expecting people to ignore something but they really loved it? Were, like, are there any surprises between your expectation and what ended up happening? Oh, there's always surprises. One of the interesting things is that we've never been able to predict how popular some blog post or feature launch might be. And you sometimes get this intuitive sense that says, this is going to be truly, truly amazing, and it's going to take the world by storm, and you high, high hopes. And then it's like, OK, that's, that's pretty good, and let's just kind of see where it goes. But sometimes relatively small things ultimately can be the last piece in some interesting puzzle where we've connected a couple of different parts of AWS and everybody says, okay, finally they all now work together in the way I need to. Now I can actually take off and, and really, really run with it. Now, w one funny little, I guess it won't be a secret after this, but sometimes some of the posts that draw the most traffic are the ones where we announce we're deprecating some service or some part of a service. And, that doesn't make me want to deprecate more things, but it, it does say that it's really important that we, we don't deprecate things very often. When we do, we're, we're very careful and we are long-term and we're vocal about it. We don't just simply take things offline. We, we realize developers build something on our services and our APIs. They count on them. And we, we say, okay, something's about to change. The world has changed. We're going to need to change along with it. Let's give you a nice glide path that very, very carefully gets down to zero, and let's give you some migration tools. Let's tell you what, give you a nice long time frame. So it, it, it is weird that we get so much traffic for deprecations, but it, it does say that it's the right thing to do to be very open and and uh, thorough when we put those things together. Okay, makes sense. So changing topics, <laughs> going back to a leadership principle: learn and be curious. You, you have to learn a lot of the technology. Um, when you write, you study, you actually go deep, you understand before you share. And, and you also want to understand what's happening out there. So you're constantly consuming. So I wonder if you can share some tips on how, how do you absorb all of this technical information and process? Like, do you have any techniques, any tools, anything that we can leverage? Sure. So you and I actually were talking about memory, or the lack thereof, I think, before this. I think I remember talking about that. So we were talking about memory. And when I'm working on a blog post, I'm pretty deeply immersed in whatever it is that I'm writing about. But I, I don't end up retaining a lot of the details afterward. What I like to do, so one of the aspects of the Amazon development model is that the team has to build a document that's called a PRFAQ, press release and frequently asked questions. And as part of the 
the process of getting a blog post, the team will send me or one of the other bloggers, they'll, they'll share their PR FAQ with us. They'll also give us access to the product, usually to the APIs and to the, the consoles. What I like to do is I will take the, the PR FAQ, I'll generally read through it once, kind of in overview fashion, get a good idea what it's all about. And then I like to build a mind map that represents all the content in that PR FAQ. And in my mind map, it generally has a lot more detail than I have space to actually address in the blog post. But what it does is it, it gives me on one visual page all the different facts about what this launch is all about. And then it gives me this somewhat equal level view of all the different things. And then within the limited space that we have, and we, we do try to be frugal with the blog posts. We, we'll never write things that are multiple thousands of words. We'll never write a post that's part one, part two, part three. We want to give you 700 to 1,000 words worth of, of fairly tightly written content. So the mind map gives me this good overview so I can pick what, what are the pieces I really want to highlight in, in this particular launch. And I, I will do my research as I'm writing. I'll use the service. I will fully admit that I forget 90% of this after I finish with the blog post. And I, I get people all the time saying, oh, it's, it's so amazing that you have this detailed, in-depth in -depth knowledge of all, every service and every feature. Nothing could actually be further from the truth. I, I honestly feel like I am, if you have some water and you pour oil on top of it, it spreads out so it's like one molecule thick. That's how I often feel about my knowledge of what's going on here. So, and, I'm, and I don't try to fake anything. There's, if, if I don't know something, I will freely admit that I had to study up on it and learn it for the purposes of writing about it. I, I don't retain every last detail of, of all these different services. It, it's also kind of weird sometimes when I need to know something, I'll go back, I'll do a, a, a Google search and I'll run into a post I wrote years ago as the education on it. And it's like, hmm, I was a better writer back then or I'm, I was smart back then or something. So uh, it, it is kind of weird to have left 3,000 posts already in, in, out on the blog. And that so, so often you run into your own content when you're trying to, to, to figure something out. Yeah, those, it's a massive volume of blog posts. So usually if you want to retrieve something, it's not the mind map, you would go to, to the actual post. I would go back and just do a search for the old, old posts. Okay, okay. Um, the, other, the other side of the coin is you're working a lot, you're producing so much written material. Can you talk a little bit about how you balance the rest of your, of your life? Sure. So this is something I, I believe in a lot, and it took me a while to really figure out how to do it. But you, you hear Jeff Bezos sometimes talk about this idea of work-life harmony. And I, I think it's really, really important. It, it's the, the, the bad part about our jobs and what we do is they're actually fun. The, the, our job is actually, in a lot of cases, it's really interesting. It's enjoyable. It can totally, totally consume us. And some, there's some phases of your life where maybe that's the right thing to do, but there's also the rest of your life should be just as important as well. And so for the, a lot of those early years that you identified, my, my children were, were kind of young. There was a time when we were launching all this stuff and my, my five children were all teenagers. So while trying to do all of that, I'm trying to deal with five unruly teenagers as well and kind of do all the, the vagaries of teenage life. And trying to balance all that with, with doing a good job and I, I remember around the first couple of reinvents and doing a lot to get ready and thinking, the easy thing to do is just say, well, don't bother me for two months. I'll be back in December. And that, that's just not fair to anybody. It's not fair to yourself. It's not fair to your family. You can't make amends for being absent for months after, after the, a long period of work. You, you can't feed your dog after forgetting your dog, feed your dog for two months. You can't bring your plants back to life with one watering. So you just try to keep all those plates spinning simultaneously. And it's not the easiest thing to do. But like, to me, ma making all those parts of your life fit together is something you have to just work really hard at and just put that same energy into all other parts of your life as you might put into your job. It it's far too easy to make your job be all consuming. And these jobs, like they're, they're, they're fun, they're interesting. They're going to take as much of you as you want to give. And there's phases of your life where maybe that's the thing you want to do. But there's, there's a lot to do besides working that's, that's very worthwhile as well. Yeah, no, I, I agree. And it's, it's important. And depends on where you are in life. But I, I completely agree. So I actually want to jump to this, the book. You, you <laughs> wrote a book. 
Um, totally obsolete, but. <laughs> but what, what was the thinking of book versus blog post? Like, you, you, you've written so much mostly on, on blog posts. Okay, so there was quite the adventure in the book. There was another author that was supposed to write the book, and I was supposed to write a few code samples to be tossed in, and we had settled on a delivery schedule, we had a bunch of chapters identified, and writing a book is actually a very regimented process. You, you always think of it being some kind of a creative process, but it's actually very, very regimented. And we had a start date, and we had delivery dates for every one of the chapters in rough form and final form. And we got the start date, and the email went out, said, okay, get going, and then there was a date a couple weeks after that where I was supposed to get the first chapter and actually put the code in there. And nothing showed up, and nothing happened. And finally, the author said, I have no idea how to do this. And the, the publisher was a little upset because it's this deeply pipeline process, and they didn't want to, several months down the road, have nothing to publish. They already were really reserving all the different resources to do that. And they basically said, Jeff, can you write the whole thing instead? And I'm like, hmm, sure, why not? I'll do this. And so, so I, I basically ended up writing, I remember how to do this. I, I wrote an entire chapter every Friday, every alternate Friday is the way I did it. And some of those chapters were probably eight or 9,000 words, but I would just clear my calendar for the day and I would just dive into the subject and write the code and just write that chapter just beginning to end just in linear fashion and just do it send it off and make it happen it was it was pretty intense but it was a, a neat thing because you you kind of know where the end is it, it's it's like when you're in school you can work really really hard and because you know when the the final is and you say i can put any amount of effort into this because after december 1st life can return back to normal so so a chapter every two weeks for whatever it was 10 weeks nine weeks 18 weeks, I guess, was, was not, that, not that awful. Managed to make that happen. And uh, again, well worth doing. But it was probably because I didn't know how hard it was going to be when I started. Are you thinking in writing another one at some point? You know, I'm not deep let's, enough let's into any of Let's write one this. together. Okay, I, I am not actually deep H enough into any of these things way. anymore. And like, I, I look at the book and like, literally nothing in there is the right way to do it anymore. Right? It, it's actually pretty sad to admit, but nothing in there is the right way to do it. I mean, this was, I, I think the first one used simply be, I think it was before most of the AWS services had consoles. Uh, all the code is PHP code. I don't think the toolkit exists anymore. I'd have to actually learn a whole lot to do it right again. Hmm. So let's jump to reInvent. Ha. First reInvent. Yes. I think something like 6,000. It was 6,000 back then. Any fun stories? Yeah, so, so up until the first day of the first reInvent, the whole success of AWS felt abstract. So we'd occasionally get these internal reports that say we're, we are doing this well, and you can, you can see that there's some hiring going on, and more people are showing up, and there's this overall kind of sense that something good is happening, but it still feels it, it was just kind of, occasionally you get an email that says, well, we, we just reached this landmark of the amount of EC2 consumption for the day. It's like, oh, cool, we, we, we reached $100, $1,000, $10,000 of EC2 a day. And like, those are great landmarks. But it, it was still hard to quantify or just see that what that meant in terms of customers, because you couldn't see the customers as a group. And I, I remember walking in very early to the, the keynote room. There were all these empty chairs set up and thinking, oh, this is actually really something. All these people paid to actually be here in Las Vegas, all these chairs here, and these are real live actual customers are gonna show up. Now, the funny thing is we didn't have an actual launch team, we didn't have the whole carefully planned out sequence of things that happens when we launch new services from the keynote at that time. I was sitting in the audience on my laptop thinking I'm just going to hit publish as Andy announces stuff. And then I realized, gee, whoever is behind me is going to be able to see all the, the new stuff on my screen. So I just quickly left out of the, the, the keynote room. But that was the, the level of lack of planning that we had for that first reInvent. Now, now we have probably 100 people involved in, in the, the launch. There, we used to actually have a room downstairs, the launch war room. Now they're all just on Slack, and I think they're all scattered all over the world. But the, 
that, that first year we did some launches and it was just me pulling up TypePad, which was the blogging platform at the time, and just hitting publish on those posts, and out they went. But that, I still remember that room. It was like, all these chairs and all these people, and hmm, this actually is something. I guess it's going to be a success after all. We, we have a few pictures from 2013, 2014, and maybe we can stop in 2016. <laughs> I, I wonder, what were the favorite launches in, oh, in that's this a long time ago. reInvent period? Oh, man, I still have that shirt. OK. Um. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the worst thing of old pictures is seeing that your wardrobe doesn't update as quickly as it should. But <laughs> I, I, I'd have to go back and see what were the launches of the day. But you know, always it's new instance types. It's been, I, I've always. Uh, the, the instance types are near and dear to me because that was the, really the, one of the first things that we, we did was, was EC2 and instances and instance types. Um, I actually try not to play particular favorites, believe it or not. And if someone really presses me on a particular favorite service, I'd say, well, they're, they're kind of like my children. I'm never going to pick a favorite child, a favorite grandchild. They, they, I, I like them all. And so. Okay, okay, fair answer. Um, so 2017. 2018, and then the last big one, 2019, which I think it was <laughs> a massive um, event. Any, any fond memories of these reinvents? It's always great to meet customers. It's so much fun to meet customers. And to me, all I'm doing is I'm sitting at my keyboard and typing. Like, I'm literally just finding the right letters on the keyboard and pushing the buttons. I don't think in like super abstract terms. I'm literally just like looking at the keyboard. Where's the A, where's the B, and just pushing the buttons. Then it turns into like all of this content and knowledge and people that are happy to meet me and say hi. It's like, wow, this is actually really cool. And it's the, the, the effect that you can have with, with words and with knowledge is to me, really interesting. The, the fact that, like, I, I, I just, I'll sit and I'll think and I'll agonize over every word and make sure I get it just the right way. And then I'll, I'll see that copied and pasted into some article in some big publication. And I can remember exactly, like, choosing those words with, with extreme care to get it just right. And to, to hear back and say, OK, those were the right words. And people got it because I got that exact words. And they, they didn't see all the ones I wrote and then deleted because it wasn't even close to what I wanted to say. It's a really interesting thing to do. But I, I love to be here. I love to just meet people. I love to say hello. Always great to just get the, the, the sense of being useful and having some kind of good positive impact. And it, it's. People have learned something new. It, sometimes they hear, well, I, I improved in my job. I've improved the, my, my family's situation in life. I got a better job. It's like, that's, that's a pretty neat thing to be able to play a tiny little part in. Yeah, no, it is. I mean, you're, you're extremely visible. You're famous in the industry. Everyone knows you. I'm sure your phone keeps ringing with ideas and offers <laughs> and projects. Why, why have you stayed in AWS so, so much time? I really love what I do. It's really, really fun to, to do what I do. And to, I actually call it living in the future because I get to see all the services just a little bit before they're finished. And so all the things that we're going to be launching this week, we've actually launched quite a few things today already. I've been reading about those and using them and commenting on them and giving the teams feedback for the last couple of months. So, so my head is already that these are kind of done deals. And we, we certainly do a lot of fine tuning toward the end. But to me, they're, I get to just live in the future a little bit and think, OK, now that this service is launched, how are customers going to put this to use? And what can they, they do with it? And it, it just doesn't ever get old. I, I do think back to my 20s and working in some little companies and with, with all these like really old people that were probably a lot younger than me, but these people that had gotten somewhat stuck in technology. And I, I remember being 20-something and talking to a couple of these folks. And they, they had kind of gotten themselves at, latched into some particular generation of technology. And the world had passed them by, but they were still talking about their, their Amiga or their job control language for their IBM batch programs or whatever it was. They were, they were stuck at some moment in time. And I said, I don't want to be that person ever. I really want to just always be on the, the leading edge, the, the part where fun, exciting things are happening. And 
I'm thinking back, and that, that old person was probably 40, and I'm 60, so it's like, wow, I'm way older than them, but I'm, I still get to be on the, this fun, leading edge. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I have one last question, and then we can open the, the, for, for the room to ask a few more, more questions before we're done. So if you could teach with some sort of magic power all developers, all new developers that are starting to, to build things, one technical thing, what, what would that be? It would absolutely be diving deep. So the, the thing that's always worked for me, and, and I have to say I was very lucky early in my career that the first computers I got to use, you'd start with bare metal and there was, there was not even, there was no persistent memory. You'd put the, the bootstrap loader in on the front panel and it would read some instructions into memory off the paper tape or the cassette. And it would, from there, the whole, it would bootstrap itself into being actually up and running. And the, the thing that that taught me is that I, I can always understand from whatever level is presented, I can understand how things actually work. So there's real, really no mysteries. And they, when I was a teenager, I took some good classes in electronics and, and in digital logic. And being able to understand at that fundamental level and just effectively grow up with the industry as things got more and more layered and more abstract. Whatever level you're working at, go one level inside that and say, how, how does this actually work? And then just always just never, never stop being curious about what's inside and you know, take it apart, view source, go to GitHub, look at some code, whatever, disassemble it if you have to, figure out what's inside, take it apart, learn something from it, maybe put it back together a little bit better. Great. Thank you. So th those are all my questions. We can now open for, for the audience. What we, I don't think we have mics, so the logistics are going to be raise your hand. Jeff will pick a few hands. Say your question. I'll repeat the question for the overflow room and for the recording. And then um, Jeff can talk about it. And remember, the process starts with hands up. So <laughs> this would be the moment where, go, okay. I, sorry, I have, a, I have a horrible question. Uh, I, I've got kids, I want them to learn to be technologists. Is there something that you did with your kids? Did you force them, did you kind of leave them to their own devices? Did you give them something to say, take this part if you want to? Oh wow, that, that is a sorry, great sorry, question. Sorry, the question is about kids and, and how to engage them in, in technical. Okay, skills. so. They, we never forced anything on our kids. We gave them just a lot of options. And to me, one of the really simple things that worked incredibly well that we never told them about is there was an unlimited book budget in our house. And we never told the kids, get any books you want. And in the, our earlier years, it, was, it, it got kind of expensive sometimes. But if there was a topic that they wanted to learn about, we would make sure that they could have the, the content that they needed. And occasionally I would just drop a book on their bed or their chair and say, hey, you might find this interesting. But we were essentially hands off as far as any particular kind of a thing that they wanted to do. And it was more just let, find an interest and actually encourage it and support it. And some, some of those things they stuck with, some they, they, they didn't. But they, they each ended up going in interesting different directions. And I, I think even, there, there's no way you can always stay ahead of them as the parent, but you can just encourage and support whatever it is that they would, would, would like to do. Cool. Here's where the loop takes us <laughs> back to hands. Over there. All right. So the question is about early experiences to get stuff in front of developers. Okay, so that, that's a, a great question for, let me think about this just a sec. It was really just go to developers and show them some services, show them some APIs, and then 
kind of light their minds on fire a little bit and say, here's something that I think you would find really interesting, and then show them why it would be interesting to them, go, go through the, the tech side, explain a little bit about the, the, the business side, and I, I think one, one thing you learn in this role is to get a good grasp of your audience and say, exactly how much tech and how much business do I need to put together? And I, I remember very distinctly in the early days, you'd go into some very tech conferences, and if you were too polished, and if you came across with too much of a business focus, you weren't taken very seriously. And so you, just, you, die, you very, very quickly sense the audience. You decide, well, what, what do I emphasize here? And it's usually the same presentation, but maybe you use a little bit of a different vocabulary, and you might just say a little more, a little bit less in particular topics. But really, really just, to me, being genuine, being authentic, knowing your topic, if you don't know something, just say, hey, that's an awesome question. I sure wish I knew the answer, but let's, let's research it together afterward if I, if I don't know it. And being also very comfortable in unusual situations. So, sometimes as an evangelist, you will find yourself in the weirdest of situations that you had no idea how you got there. I, I remember once, I, I was traveling to some country where we'd n we had no infrastructure whatsoever, and one of our Amazon marketing folks just said, well, I will, this was before there was an AWS marketing organization. So they said, I'll, I'll set you up with a whole bunch of great stuff. And they're just leading me around from place to place, and I don't speak the local language, so I don't really know what's going on. And we, we go to this one place in the afternoon, and we're in this kind of dusty room, and everybody's just sitting around, kind of checking their watches. This is back when people wore watches. They're all like checking their watches, and Suddenly, they're like, oh, it's time. Let's go. Like, okay, fine. And we, we like walk out, and it turns out I'm actually a guest on a live TV show. Like, I didn't actually know this. And, <laughs> and I didn't speak the language, and there was no discussion of how we were going to translate. But being able to be very comfortable in these surprising and brand new situations has turned out to be a really good life skill. Thank you. <laughs> we have time for one more. I'll go in the back there. You have to speak loud. Those original AWS uh, logos for each service, do you know how the process that they used to come up with those? And it didn't, did it have anything to do with your love of Legos? <laughs> OK. <laughs> Question is around logos design. Let's say it, it definitely had nothing to do with, with me. Um, I remember there, there was this one early designer, her name was Aiden. I remember Aiden being like, she was the go-to person for designing new logos for, for quite some time. And uh, it, you can't satisfy everybody with any of these logos, and there, there's effectively something of a visual language in them, I, I suppose. Uh, art, art is not my strong, strong, uh, strong suit, strong suite, not sure which word to use there. And I, in fact, one of the things that when people say, what, what should you have done instead of tech? I, I find that more of an artistic side would be really helpful. Like colors, shapes, light, all those interesting things. I don't understand any of those. <laughs> Which might sound not relevant, but a lot of interesting hobbies turn out to have photography as part of them. And it, it turns out that if you can't take good pictures of things you built, then you, you can't do you can't really represent it. If you want to look good on video and you don't understand how light and shadows work, you're not so good there. If you can't address your monitor screen. So th there's always a thing that you sure wish you knew more about that you actually don't. Good. So before we, we go out, the, um, the developer relations team in AWS wanted to commemorate this moment. So they commissioned a Lego set with oh my your picture. I don't know if your wife is going to be happy or not about this idea, but here you have your custom-made oh, wow. Lego that set. Oh, wow. That is awesome. So, thank you. Thank you. Wow. So cool. Thank you. <laughs> totally, totally <So> cool. <laughs> maybe we can take a, a selfie picture with the audience also to commemorate yeah, today. Yeah, let's, let's try that. Before. Let, let's try that. I, I did put my phone here somewhere. There we go. You got it? So yeah. if, if you guys want to okay. do whatever, it's All right, I promise not to fall off the stage. We're almost over on the presentation. All right. Let's see if this is going to work. I think that's actually going to work. Okay, you in the back there need to smile more. Okay. All right, one more. Awesome. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Enjoy the rest of reInvent. <laughs>